Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, we're going to make a chef's knife for my sister's birthday. So my sister loves to cook, she loves to entertain, so this knife is going to be made for her birthday. And uh, it's going to be a pretty complicated knife from the steel making side because we're going to start with this right here, just a bunch of raw steel. Okay, so today's blade is going to be a modified ladder pattern, pattern welded Damascus Sanmai blade. That's a mouthful, right? So what does all that mean? Okay, so let's start with pattern welding or Damascus as it's also known. Basically, pattern welded steel means that you're taking uh, a number of different kinds of steel, like these pieces we have right here, you're stacking them up and layering them. So later on you'll etch that steel and what that will result in is a complicated and interesting pattern in steel. So, ladder pattern. That's a pattern that looks sort of like a ladder as the little waves undulate back and forth on the blade. We're going to make a kind of modified version of that for this blade. Now, one last thing, Sanmai. In the Japanese tradition, it's very common for blades to be laminated from an exterior steel which is fairly um, flexible or shock resistant, and then a harder steel which is used for the edge. This is very common not only in kitchen cutlery, but it comes out of the tradition of sword making where shock resistance and edge holding are both, both very important. Um, uh, to the uh, quality of the, uh, the blade. So that means that in addition to the pattern welding part of this, we're also going to be laminating three pieces of steel together. So it's going to work like this. Basically it's kind of like a sandwich. The bread on the outside is going to be the Damascus and then in the center is going to be mono steel 1095 which is a very hard durable type of carbon steel and makes an excellent uh, edge for a knife. Now, in this case, the Damascus steel is going to be composed of two kinds of steel, 1050, which is a sort of medium carbon steel, and uh, 15N20, which has a high nickel content. When you etch those two steels, the nickel remains fairly bright and doesn't etch very much, whereas the um, 1050 will uh, etch more heavily, and that will be revealed as a very stark pattern in the surface of the steel. If you've never made Damascus steel or don't have the facilities, no problem, you could just as easily use a single bar of 1080, 1084, or 1095 steel for this project. This doesn't have to be forge welded. We'll show you the outlines of how to make the Damascus, but I'm not going into super deep detail there. I'll be doing another video about making ladder pattern Damascus steel soon. All right, so let's get started. Basically, the way that this works is as follows. I'll forge weld a single billet of Damascus, chop it into thirds, restack it, and re-weld it. Then grind chunks out of the steel in a sort of ladder pattern, then smash it. This will produce what's known as ladder pattern Damascus. This pattern will be modified in ways that you'll see later, making it slightly different from the classic ladder pattern. Here goes. We'll start with 15 or so pieces of 1 8 by 1 inch steel, alternating 1050 and 15 and 20, all of it carefully cleaned of mill scale. Heat up the forge to about 2400 degrees, flux with anhydrous borax, and when it reaches welding temperature, I squash it in my forge press, setting the welds. Then I draw it out, forge it into a pretty clean rectangle. Cool it down, grind it flat. Cut it in three pieces, restack, re-weld. 
Now I've got a piece with about 50 layers. I'll grind that flat, then put it in my mill and mill out grooves every half inch with a 3 8 inch ball end mill. Very tedious. Flip it over and repeat, moving the center of my channels down 0.250 inches from the set on the other side. This is what's going to give it that ladder effect. Now, once I'm done, it's back to the forge, heat it up, and squash it flat. This will cause the layers to undulate, pushing up where they've been cut out, and that will form a sort of wave pattern. You'll see later what this does. If we were going to be making pure ladder pattern Damascus, we'd pretty much quit right here. But in this case, we're doing something different. Now, I'll chop this billet in half, grind it flat yet again, and form a new billet. This will be the Sanmai billet that will actually form the knife. With two layers of the ladder pattern on there, I now have about a hundred layers of ladder pattern with a layer of plain steel in the middle, which will form the cutting edge. Now, if we just ground a knife straight from this billet, we'd have a classic ladder pattern Damascus, but we're going through one more step. Instead of forging the billet out lengthwise, which would stretch the pattern out, I'm gonna forge it out widthwise, if that's a word, so that the distance between the undulations remains about the same. This will make some changes in the overall pattern, however, and we'll see how that works out later. The pattern that results is a sort of cross between a ladder pattern and what Japanese smiths call mokume. If you watch what I do carefully, you'll see why it comes out that way. Anyway, this will ultimately form a sort of plate. I want to make sure that when I'm done, this plate is as flat as I can get it. I'll also normalize it, heating it to about 1600, then letting it air cool. Then I'll cut it down the middle with a cutting wheel on my angle grinder, forming two knife blade blanks. Now I'll surface grind the steel to make it totally flat. Oh, wait a minute. I don't have a surface grinder. So I'll take it to my belt grinder and get it as flat as I can on the flat plating. This is not a perfect way to do it, but if you're careful, you can get it flat enough. The only part I really need flat is the tang. The blade is going to get ground to a long taper anyway, so it doesn't have to be perfectly, perfectly flat. Okay, so now we've got the steel made. It's time to turn to the making of the entire knife itself. This blade is going to be what's known as a full tang knife, meaning that the tang or handle portion of the blade actually extends underneath the entire surface of the handle. This makes for a very durable and uh, sturdy and long live knife. Okay, so let's turn to the design of the knife. I'll draw out the general shape of the knife. This is basically what's known as a French style chef's knife which goes sort of straight along the edge, then curves up quickly, as opposed to the German style, which has a more continuous curve. For my money, the French got this one right, but that's just me. So I made a bunch of chef's knives when I first started making blades, and I learned a lot in the process. Here are some things I want to avoid. Insufficient finger clearance. Give your fingers room to rock the blade back and forth without whacking them on the chopping block excessive thickness. An eighth of an inch looks really manly and substantial, which is great, but it's actually a little thick for a chef's knife. The thinner the knife is, the sharper it is. Anyway, there we are, design complete. Because I've made a few of these by now, I'll freehand it on the blade, then adjust the details as I go. Like most of my designs, I tend to draw with a rapidly rotating abrasive belt rather than a pencil. All right, I'll rough grind the external dimensions using both the belt grinder and the disc grinder. Here's one little detail. I'm going to use this tiny little attachment here to grind the radius in this section here. Finally, 
I'll grind the bevels. Grinding bevels is quite tricky when you're grinding a very long skinny blade like this. So I take my time working to make everything neat and symmetrical. I'll start with my 40 grit ceramic belt and then work up to 60 grit then 120. The single most important thing is that I want my grind line to climb all the way up to the spine but I don't want it to bite in at the plunge line on the top of the blade. It's got to end perfectly at that plunge line. So I have to be very careful at that transition where the plunge line comes up to the top of the blade. The moment I'm almost there, I'll stop. At this point, I'm going to grind the cutting edge to a thickness of about 10 thousandths of an inch. My final thickness will be around six or seven thousandths. That'll be nice and sharp, so I'm leaving a little room to take off the last bits after heat treatment. For more tips on grinding bevels, check out my video about belt grinder techniques and my series about making a hunting knife, which goes into a lot of details about how to set your bevels. Once I've got my bevels just about right, I'll drill two 3 16 inch holes in the tang. I'm going to be using blind or corby fasteners, so this is the appropriate size for the waist portion of this particular size corby pin. Again, you can check out the hunting knife series, which will explain you know, a little bit more about how these pins work. Now I'll go ahead and heat treat the knife. I've already normalized the steel, so I'm going straight to hardening. Because of the way the knife is made, with the cutting edge composed of 1095, I'm not all that concerned about the heat treating qualities of 1050 or 15N20. If it doesn't harden, I don't care. I'm just interested in the 1095. As I just now alluded, 1095 is an oil hardening steel, so I'll heat it to roughly 1475 in my heat treating oven, then quench it in warm canola oil. I could use a fancy heat treating oil, mineral oil, transmission fluid, all kinds of things will probably work and it'll probably come out okay. The advantage of canola oil is just that it's a kind of environmentally friendly oil, it doesn't fill my shop with really horrible smelling smoke, and it works just fine for 1095. Now if you're planning on quenching marginally hardenable steels like 1095, do a little research. Canola and peanut oil have quicker cooling curves through the nose of the hardening curve than some other vegetable oils. So you want to be aware of that if you're just going to grab something at the grocery store. Now that it's hardened, I'll temper it at about 450 for two two-hour cycles. Once the blade's been hardened and tempered, I'll clean all the scale off the handles and the ricasso by hand. I'm using 320 grit sandpaper on a machinist's block. Next, I'll grind the blade to its final dimensions using a fresh 120 grit belt, then 220, then gator grit belts up to 65 micron. Easy does it here. The edge is extremely thin now and it'll overheat in a heartbeat, which will ruin the temper of the steel and soften the edge. So take your time. As I said earlier, I'm aiming for about six or seven thousandths of an inch, and that's where I've ended up. Now I'll return to hand sanding using 320 wet or dry sandpaper on the sanding block. Then I'll clean up the grind lines by hand, making sure to get rid of all vertical scratches. This is super key. Every video that you'll watch of mine where we talk about sanding things, you always want to get all the scratches off of the earlier abrasives. If you don't, it'll look terrible at the end. So, next I'll put it in a vise and go up to 600 by hand, followed by super fine grit scotch bright. Since I'll be etching it, I'm not crazy on trying to get it super shiny. As I said earlier though, I do want to eliminate absolutely every grinding mark though so that we see only the scratches of the last abrasive I use. Next, I'll carefully degrease the knife and immerse it in a dilute solution of ferric chloride, a liquid that's sold as circuit board etching. 
I'm going about, oh, probably 20 or 30 to 1 ferric to water. I also heat the water a little bit, and that'll help speed up the edge. Now be advised, this is a caustic material, so be very careful. Once it's diluted, it's not going to burn your hand, but still, you want to be careful with it. Wear safety glasses and take normal precautions to keep yourself from being injured. The amount of time you have to immerse the knife will depend based on how much you dilute the ferric and what kind of effect you're looking for. I'll take it out after watching precisely one inning of baseball, probably 20 minutes. It's not an exact science. At this point, I'll clean it off with Scotch-Brite again, removing all the oxide. If you haven't gotten enough etch at this point, that's no problem. Just degrease it, put it back in the ferric, and go until you like it. There are a lot of possible effects you can gain from etching. You can leave some oxides on the blade. You can aim for a really deep etch that leaves a visible distinction between the various steels and the knife. You can do all kinds of different things. What I've aimed for here is to be able to see the etch in the knife itself rather than leaving oxides on the blade. I personally just don't really like that look that much. But everybody's tastes are different, so you should do what looks good to your eye. Okay, so the blade's all taken care of. Let's turn to the handle. While the blade is etching, I'll take a piece of Gabon ebony split it lengthwise on my bandsaw, then flatten it on the disc grinder. It's the same kind of wood that's used for piano keys. Very hard, durable, oily wood that can be polished to a nice shine. I keep the wood slightly oversized while I'm flattening it because the disc grinder will tend to roll the corners a little and I want it as flat as possible so there are no gaps between the wood and the tang. Now I'll round off the front face of the handle scales. I want this surface to be exactly as it's going to end up in the finished state when I install the scales. So I have to know what the design is going to look like. The point here is that when we're finishing the knife, I don't want to sand it at all later on. This is very important because if you try messing with it when the blade has already been polished, you're going to scratch up your blade. The rest of the scales I don't care about, but this has to be perfect. So note that I'll clamp the two pieces together so that the two faces remain absolutely symmetrical as I modify them slightly by sanding. Symmetry is super important in making high quality knives. If one handle scale doesn't line up with the other, it'll look really amateurish. Now because ebony is capable of taking a high sheen, I use the sanding block with 220 grit sandpaper, then hand sand it using 320, then 600, then 1500 grit wet or dry. There it is. Nice and smooth and glossy. Going up this high on a handle made of oh, maple or something like that would be a total waste of time, but it's about right for oily exotic woods like this. Similar woods might be cocobolo or rosewood. Now I'll drill the holes in the scales for the Corby fasteners. Notice I'm using an old drill bit as an alignment pin so that I don't drill the holes in the wrong places. You want these very, very precise. If you don't use that pin, it's easy to get them out of alignment and then everything gets screwed up. So the order of operations is this. First hole drilled from the inside, through the tang, pin inserted, second hole drilled from the inside through the tang, then first hole in the second scale from the first scale side, pin it again, and do the final hole. Again, care is used to make sure that the front faces are very precisely aligned before I start drilling the holes on the second scale. See my video about the hunting knives and step drills for more information on how this whole process works. Once I've drilled the holes, I'll score around the tang and trim off some of this screw up wood with my bandsaw. Now that we've got everything set, I'll mask off the blade to make sure it doesn't get scratched up in the final operations. I'll be using a two-part epoxy to glue the handle scales in place. Before I glue, I carefully degrease the blade. Epoxy won't stick to greasy stuff. I'll also wipe the inner surface of the wood with lacquer thinner. Some exotic woods like cocobolo, ebony, and rosewood are quite oily, so the epoxy will stick better if you remove any surface oils. If you're using a dry wood like maple or walnut, there's absolutely no need to do this. 
Now, making sure I've thought through the order of assembly so I don't get halfway through and realize I forgot something, I'll mix the epoxy according to the manufacturer's directions and begin assembling the handle scales. I'll also install the Corby fasteners, epoxying them in place too. Make sure to clean all the squeeze out along the front edge of the handle scale. You don't want to have to chip this stuff out and scratch the blade. Clamp tightly, but not so tightly that all the glue squeezes out. Then leave it to cure according to the manufacturer's instructions. Once the epoxy is cured for 24 hours, I'll grind the handle scales to a shape that feels pleasing to me. I'll also make some final adjustments in the overall shape. Thinning the handle, modifying the bottom surface of the ricasso to improve cutting clearance, and giving the barest suggestion of a bird's beak to the handle. I always want to tune all the details at the end to get the absolute best look possible, at least to my eye. I'll be taking these up to about 65 micron. Then once I'm happy with all the surfaces of the handle, I'll go ahead and finish off the handle all the way up to 1000 grit. Then I'll sharpen it up and test it out. So that's it, all ready for my sister's kitchen. Thanks for watching and see you soon. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades.